is what I fell in love with when I was a little boy growing up in Chicago, um, listening to people like B.B. King and uh, Lightning Hopkins and Earl Hooker, Muddy Waters, um, all that kind of stuff. And so rather than giving you a ton of just kind of arbitrary little, oh, here's a, here's a this and here's a that, I want to talk about some kind of different factions of, of, of what I would call real blues because there's a difference between sort of the later rock interpretation of blues and what is really traditionally, you know, part of the art form. And I think that um, part of what made the sort of rock influence, at least the first generation rock influence stuff from the 60s and into the 70s, so great is there they had such a firm understanding of the uh of of the original source whereas kind of the more generations we go into the future um the less of a connection to the source is prevalent and it it generally kind of waters it down some okay and um the essence um is not finesse it's primal it's uh it's in a way, the prettier and more perfect it is, um, the less pure it is. Um, and that's not saying that you shouldn't work to, to, to become as good of a musician as you can. But I do find that the more refined of a musician you become, the more um, uh, school, as it were, the more difficult it is to play primally, all right? Uh, Captain Beefheart has a, a famous ten uh, commandments of guitar playing, and one of his uh, one of those commandments, and you should look those up because I think that uh, it's very applicable. I think you'll have fun reading it. But uh, one of them is to play like a drowning man. So, you know, hence, if you know how to swim, it's a lot harder to act like you're a drowning man, right? Because you know how to swim. So therein lies the paradox. So. To talk about blues, and I'm just going to break it into a bunch of different, this is going to be a rather long in, long section here. There's a couple of different approaches. Um, I'm going to skip over the initial uh, inception stuff because I'm, you know, because we're focusing on electric playing here. Um, so I'm going to go right to kind of when all these musicians were relocating from the south uh, up to Chicago or Memphis to centers where they could find employment, okay? Um, that's another thing to kind of keep in mind. There's a working man aspect to blues playing because they, these were, these were, these were blue-collar people, okay? This is very not upper society stuff, okay? This is, you know, these are guys who, who, uh, who slaughtered hogs and, uh, and uh, lived on the street and, and uh, wanted to get some, if you know what I mean, and... Uh, you know, it's it, it, it just a, a primal way of life, put it that way, less refined, okay? And that came out in the music. So with Muddy Waters being kind of the, the, the first focal point of, like, electric blues, the whole modern electric band came from Muddy Waters. The, you know, the concept of bass and drums and a piano and a harp player and a guitar player and a front man, all that kind of stuff. That's very much Muddy Waters' invention, and it just kind of happened in Chicago in the late 40s, early 50s. And so Muddy, um, what I played at in the beginning there is sort of a takeoff on, uh, on uh, a thing of his called Rolling Stone, which is where a band from England got their name from. And, uh, and if you notice, I'm playing with my fingers, and um, you can get more meat this way.
obviously later, Jimi Hendrix would use that kind of approach on several songs like Voodoo Child and all that kind of stuff, but it comes from, you know, Muddy Waters. It comes from this approach. And it's very kind of, it's, it's, it's rhythmic, and it's generally kind of tonal center. It doesn't change keys. You know, a lot of these, a lot of these early, uh, a lot of the earlier stuff would not modulate, wouldn't go to the four or five. It would just kind of pump on a one. And, you know, the only reason that I'm kind of starting here is because I'm just trying to give you kind of a contextual thing of the evolution of it and how it bled into all the other types of music. And so that's very rustic, very primal. I generally like to play that kind of style with my fingers. There was another guy from Houston, Texas named Lightman Hopkins that um, he would, um, in a similar style, playing in the key of E. Again, we're talking about the same period, okay? As you can see, he was a little flashier. He, he would play more kind of high up on the neck, and that little lick I played, that's a very Lightning Hopkins-y kind of lick. And then something that the folk players in the folk generation would later do that. That's totally Lightning Hopkins as well, and that there was that other lick that's very Lightning, the which is a beautiful example of a turnaround. You know, people talk about turnarounds in jazz and obviously in blues too, but that's one of my favorites, and that's a that's a Lightning Hopkins lick. And so Lightning kind of introduces this slightly flashier, uh, you know, uptown kind of thing, and. Um, and that's, again, the same era, you know, early 50s, late 40s, okay? Now, also around this time, I talked in the hamstring section about T-Bone Walker. And you have T-Bone Walker in this same period. And I did an example in, in, in that, and you can go back and watch that. But just with no vibrato, playing a big guitar. No vibrato, playing back by the bridge. Very uh, One thing that he did do, though, that would bleed later is he played a lot of what they call chromatics, okay? Chromatic meaning, you know, you know, it's chromatic. There's, it's not playing through a scale necessarily, okay? So... And he loved, one of my favorite notes in the world is the flat five. Okay, so... That's the five of G. I love that note. It's a blue note, you know. And if you bend it ever so slightly, you bend, you bend into the five. And it's a beautiful thing, and that's very, very T-Bone Walker. So anyway, he enters, so he enters, he, he's bringing a bit of sophistication. He brings a bit of... Of, uh, of, of jazz sensibility. He loved Charlie Christian. He loved Wes Montgomery and stuff like that. But he was a blues player, okay? So he's playing very simply. Um, and then he influences, you know, B.B. King, who in the beginning, if you listen to early B.B. King stuff from the 50s, like, uh, like the Singing the Blues album, okay? Um, he's playing virtually exactly like T-Bone Walker, okay? And if all you know of B.B. is like Live at the Regal and later era stuff, you should definitely go back and listen to some stuff when he was on Crown or Kent Records in the 50s, because you'll hear where his evolution came from. I talked about in the other lesson about the use of vibrato, okay? So 
you know, obviously BB introduces that into the equation, and now all of a sudden you have, you know, basically the birth of modern electric guitar playing. Now, on the, the other flip side of this, you have Chuck Berry enters the picture in the mid-50s, okay? Now, Chuck is, you know, for me, when I was learning to play guitar, it was like the big obstacle to kind of jump over, the kind of Chuck Berry... I, th I feel like every musician should, every guitar player for that matter, should go through kind of Chuck, a Chuck Berry phase because as important as B.B. King was, B.B. King in the 1950s didn't have the record sales that Chuck Berry had. And so Chuck, as a lead guitarist, songwriter, whatever, you know, his impact on music is in some ways greater, I think. And the thing about Chuck is, is he played in double stops a lot. Double stops meaning two notes at a time, okay? kind of mimicking kind of like sax players from that time where when sax players are bending notes, um, the notes kind of bleed into one another, okay? And you can kind of approximate that by playing double stops, you know, like I was doing. <laughs> concept of using double stops and playing more kind of aggressively, now all of a sudden you have rock and roll, okay? And also, you know, you, you can't discredit, you know, his use of, uh, of uh, rhythm playing because that again, I mean, you know, if you can't groove, and actually I'll talk about this for a second because this is an important thing to do, you know, the whole concept of... That's Jimmy Reed, okay? Jimmy Reed came around around this time, too, in the 1950s. But what Chuck did was Chuck, because he was playing in horn keys, B-flat and, and G-sharp and E-flat and all this kind of stuff, is he'd play in a box position, but he'd move it around like a piano player would. So instead of just going... <laughs> because it's dancing, man, you know, it's making music, you know, it's, 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 and uh, again, a lot of this stuff is, these guys were inspired by things that weren't guitars, okay, like that's Chuck mimicking Johnny Johnson, his old piano player, who was a marvelous musician and incredibly important to him, B.B. Uh, King, with his vibrato, he's mimicking a slide, you know, all these things are taking things that are like kind of out of context and putting them into the context. And that's the thing about music is you want to take as many things and kind of put them in your pot and see what you co see what comes out. Hopefully it's going to come out good, you know. So um, uh, I want to bring us into kind of the 1960s, um, kind of right before... Uh, the, the British invasion happened and all the baby boomer guitar players, the rock players, you know, uh, start entering the equation. So you, now all of a sudden you have, you know, everybody I've just mentioned and a lot of others, I'm, I'm skipping over a bunch, but I, like I said, I kind of just want to give you a bit of a history lesson and give you some examples just so that maybe you'll go and listen 
uh, seek out some of these records and 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 put them in to your to your uh, subconscious because so much of this stuff. I'll tell you a secret. Well, it's not a secret, but I'll tell you something like uh, people come up to me sometimes and uh, and they'll say, "Oh man, you know, I love so and so, or I love so and so and so and so." And then if they're playing that night or something, I'll see them play, and I won't see any of that or hear any of that in their playing. What you listen to in, in inherently is what is going to come out of you. And so if you learn a bunch of names or learn a bunch of albums, kind of buzzwords and stuff like that, but you haven't really kind of really digested it, you know, it's not going to come out in your playing. Like whatever you have spent the most time listening to and digesting, that's what's going to come out. An uh, old friend of mine from Austin, Texas, Stephen Bruton, always said, life will make a liar out of you. So, so, you know, just be careful with that stuff, you know, like really take time and digest this stuff so that it can come out, you know, because it'll, it'll reap you big dividends in the end. But anyway, coming into uh, the 1960s, uh, Freddie King, okay, I've talked about B.B. King, I've talked about Albert King. Uh, Freddie King w actually lived in Chicago for all of the 1950s, okay? Couldn't get arrested, couldn't get a record deal, couldn't get nothing going for himself. And um, he learned to play from, uh, from two guys that I also want you to go check out. Um, there's, there was a guy named Earl Hooker, who I've mentioned a couple times, who was kind of a, uh, a secret weapon in Chicago. He was an incredible slide player. I'm going to talk about him more in the slide section here. Um, but Earl Hooker, and then there was another guy named Eddie Taylor, okay? And Eddie Taylor was a, was a very influential player in Chicago in the 1950s who inspired a lot of folks. And that Jimmy Reed thing I played you earlier, remember? <laughs> the building block of like modern music, that's Eddie Taylor, okay? Jimmy Reed got the credit for it, but that's Eddie Taylor. So Google up Eddie Taylor, all right? But anyway, those two guys, Earl Hooker and Eddie Taylor, were two huge influences on Freddie King. Now, Freddie King, to me, is, is kind of... Uh, he's, a, he's a perfect bridge into the 60s and into the kind of uh, baby boomer, uh, you know, rock blues guys, you know, because he had more aggression than B.B. King. Um, he had uh, more fire, as it were, um, and he had probably a bit more vocabulary than Albert King, okay? So with Freddie, now obviously everybody... Uh, goes through a phase in her life where they play where they play hideaway, you know. Everybody, everybody gets into that. But the thing about Freddie that kind of, like I said, he was a huge influence on Eric Clapton in particular, is he had this real stinging, very physical way of playing, you know. guitar more and it to me really as far as uh the rock approach as it were you know it kind of starts with freddie king and uh also period wise like i said it kind of lines up all right so um what i would say to kind of close out this section is if you like blues you know to me there's a difference between blues and like rock music Okay, and there should be a difference, you know, um, and I love it all, 
but one of my kind of things that kind of gets me a little bit is, you know, people talk about blues, and it's like you really, there's a lot of, you know, to, to me, there's a huge well. We live in the information age where you can access anything at a moment's notice. And so if you hop on your phone and Spotify Earl Hooker or Spotify Eddie Taylor or Spotify, uh, uh, you know, uh, Professor Longhair or, 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 or even Captain Beefheart or something like that, you're going to find it all right there. Dig past the, the, the initial people that you become uh, enamored with because if you go to the source of it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be conveyed purer and better than if you're getting it secondhand, okay? Think of it like as if you're making a second or third or fourth or fifth generation copy of an original. It's going to degrade a bit every time you go down the line, okay? And so it, I, I just uh, I wanted to kind of give you somewhat of, a, you know, as condensed as I could do, sort of overview of kind of blues on an electric guitar form over like a 12-year period, just to kind of give you some brief examples and give you some names to maybe look up and then, uh, you know, the rest is really kind of up to you. Um, and so, uh, you know, and feel free, you know, I mean, I'm on social media and stuff like that. You know, I also have, you know, people have really gotten into my Spotify playlists because I like to make playlists of certain things highlighting some of these players, you know. So, uh, you know, use technology to your, to your advantage like you are right here with this course, you know, and, uh, and get into some real blues, all right? <laughs>